turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to begin in verse number 1, read down through verse number 6. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 1, through verse number 6, says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you uh, that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, even as you are called, and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Heavenly Father, as we approach your word, we are in need of your work. Father, I pray that the Spirit would illumine our minds as we understand your truth, that we would receive it, embrace it, live it out. Lord, I pray that um, you would give me clarity of speech to make your word uh, and your truth plain. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Uh, Commitment is a scary word. For a lot of people in our day and age, we don't like to be tied down to any one thing because we're afraid that something better might come along and we might not be able to grasp whatever it is that might come along. Uh, This aversion uh, to commitment has been crowned with a name in our day and age with the acronyms FOMO, fear of missing out. We always want to keep our options open. So we never want to commit to anything. The truth is, however, is that we are always committed to something. Those who fear missing out and so they don't commit are indeed committing to never miss out on anything. They're committed people to their own agendas. And so if you dig a little deep into our motivations you'll find that in the human heart, there are all sorts of commitments living there. The commitments of our hearts, of course, are not revealed in what we say as much as in what we do. They're revealed more, not in the words that we speak, as much as in the actions of our lives. What we truly are committed to, what we truly love, is revealed in what we do. So we could say that we are committed to someone or something, but how we live shows the functional commitments of our hearts. The functional commitments of our hearts. So we could say that we are committed to peacemaking. We could probably all say that. In fact, I would say that that is the formal commitment of most everybody in the room today. We are committed to peacemaking. But oftentimes the question comes up more not in regards to what we're more not in regards to what we're formally committed, but rather in regards to what we're functionally committed to. What does our actions say about what we truly are committed to? How we live in relationship with one another and the people in your life will provide the necessary evidence that discloses your true commitments and my true commitments. God in Christ has created a new people through whom he intends to display his wisdom and his grace. We learned that in Ephesians chapter 2, that God has taken those who were hostile toward him and toward each other, and through the blood of Christ has brought these two into one new creation in the church in order to display his wisdom and and his grace. He's done that by bringing peace that removed the hostility or the war that existed between them. He then takes this body of people and commissions them to work together for the sake of his great name among the nations. 
These doctrinal truths that were expounded in Ephesians chapter 2 set the stage for our text this morning in Ephesians chapter 4, <coughs> where Paul takes us from the glorious truths of doctrine in the gospel and begins to tell us how those are supposed to play out in our daily living. In other words, we're going from doctrine to application. It is necessary to know the truths that ground our unity and that make peace with God and with each other. But the knowledge of that is not sufficient. We also must take that knowledge and now put it into action. And this text helps us do that as we discern the attitudes and actions that we are to adopt as peacemakers. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul marks the transition from one half of the letter to the application half of the letter by urging us and commanding us to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called. That's the idea of the word vocation. It's not talking about your occupation as much as it's talking about your calling to salvation. And what Paul commands us at the very beginning here is that we would live consistent with the gospel that we have received, the gospel that he has unpacked in the previous three chapters, that salvation that has come to us in Jesus Christ, that the way we live would match up with the salvation that we have received so that we wouldn't live out in daily lives anymore as spiritually dead people, but rather we would live as people that have been made spiritually alive in Christ. Uh, in other words, Paul is urging us that the outside behaviors would match the inside transformation. It would flow out of who we are. And that command really governs the entire second half of the book of Ephesians as he fleshes that out for us and what that looks like for us. Uh, He's calling us to match our formal commitment of confession to the functional commitment to our actions. See, we don't just say we follow Christ. We begin to live that out. And I believe Paul provides for us three functional commitments in this text, in the first three verses of chapter 4, that help us flesh out how we might walk worthy in our relationships to one another. And three functional commitments that will flesh out how we walk worthy in our relationships with one another. That's what I want to consider with you this morning from these three, three verses. And the first commitment that fleshes out this peacemaking effort is the commitment to have the right attitude. The commitment to have the right attitude. Uh, tell, Paul tells us those attitudes in verse number two. Humility, meekness, and patience. Humility, meekness, and patience. He says that you are to walk worthy of the calling that you have been called with, with all lowliness and meekness. And with long-suffering. Humility has been a largely neglected virtue in human society, really throughout the the history. We're we're pretty arrogant right now in our day and age, but there's been a lot of arrogance all throughout human history. Humility has not been a very prized possession uh, of the human society. We, We tend to glorify those who boast about their accomplishments and put themselves forward and show themselves to be great as a society. We don't prize humility as much as we prize confident arrogance. And that's been true of a lot of leaders throughout uh, world history. And you only need to look at the political arena today to see that humility is not prized very much in our leaders today. Arrogance is the word of the day. Major on your accomplishments and strengths and exaggerate your opponent's weaknesses. 
And arrogance might get you elected into office, but it will not measure up to the calling of our salvation. And so Paul says you are to walk worthy of this calling with humility. When it comes to our salvation, listen, there is no accomplishments that we can roll out that show people that we merit or deserved what we received. There's nothing that we can point to that says, ah, here we go. This is the reason God saved me. Not in ourselves. The only record that we can run on, the only record that we have is a record that proves how undeserving we are of God's mercy and how deserving we would be of God's wrath. And so humility is really at the very center of the gospel, and pride is very inconsistent with the salvation that we have received. It doesn't necessarily mean, on the other hand, that self-deprecation is the pinnacle of humility either. Throughout history, there's been records of people that have treated their bodies and treated Uh, themselves very severely in a self-denial in order to try to gain some sort of humility. But humility is not brought about by a severe treatment of of the body. And because oftentimes those kind of attempts only provide a a greater self-preoccupation. As we're so focused on ourselves and trying to deny And, of course, there is self-denial within the Christian life. Luke has taught us that as we've studied that. But true humility is, in in fact, defined for us in the Scriptures as in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, where Paul reminds us that what counts is a frame of mind that considers the other person as better than ourselves. Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count it robbery with God uh, in order to make himself of no reputation and take upon him the form of a servant. It's Jesus Christ that provides us the model of humility. And what Philippians teaches us is that it's a preferential attitude that puts the needs of others above our own. And that's what true humility looks like. The attitude of humility is focused on the good of others and is willing to defer from our preferences if it benefits others. That's a foundational key in peacemaking. Because peacemaking will not grow in the soil of pride. We must adopt an attitude of humility and be functionally, not just formally committed to humility, but functionally committed to humility in our interactions with other people. Peter urges us to clothe ourselves with humility in 1 Peter 1, 5, chapter 5, verse 5. Clothe ourselves in humility toward one another so that when you get up in the morning, you need to put on the clothes of humility. And you need to wear them all day long as you interact with your family and your coworkers and your neighbors and the various relationships that you have. As you walk through the doors on Sunday morning, you must put on the clothes of humility. That's what the scriptures, that's what the the, uh, Bible, that's what God expects of us. That we are consciously expecting to serve rather than to be served. And so we are to walk worthy of our calling in humility. Second, he says, the second attitude is the attitude of meekness. The attitude of meekness. This is a very rich term in its meaning. Includes the idea of gentleness and self-control, but not in the sense of being weak. Instead, what it describes is the very opposite. It describes someone of great strength who has control over his strength. It's someone whose strength is harnessed by love to accomplish a particular goal. 
And so you could define it as strength under control. Not out of control. That term was used in other literature, to describe domesticated animals that were disciplined and trained. And the meek person doesn't use their strength or power to belittle people or gain an advantage for themselves. Rather, the meek person harnesses their strength to bring about good for their fellow believer. A meek person, therefore, will respond to those who sin against them with gracious compassion because they're not out of control. They're willing to come alongside of other people and help them and move them along. The meek person doesn't throw their weight around and insist on getting what they want. They don't use their authority, their longevity, their superior intellectual skills, or the resources that they have to get what they want. The meek person doesn't do that. Instead, they recognize the ways that God has blessed them, and they use that to bless others. Those character traits, humility and meekness, are a central component to the character of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter eleven twenty nine. 29, listen to how Jesus describes himself. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. So if we want to be formed into the image of Jesus Christ, if we want to live in relationships that honor Christ, we're going to have to put on the attitudes of meekness and humility. Finally, these attitudes build out in the third one that we see here, and that's patience. Patience is one of those qualities that we really want to have a lot more of, but we really don't want to encounter situations that we have to use it in, right? Are are you with me on that? I've talked to, I don't don't know that I've ever talked to a Christian that's like, I have enough patience, right? Everybody's like, okay, I got to grow in patience, right? Right? But we all like to avoid the situations and the kind of people that would test our patience. We want it kind of zapped on instant sanctification in patience. We're impatient that we're not patient enough, right? This is kind of the the nature of patience. But it is vital for us to adopt this kind of attitude in our relationships, A patient person, or the way that is translated here in verse 2, is suffers long. It's a long-suffering person. They have a long fuse. They are aware that the people that they interact with are broken people. A patient person has an awareness that each person with whom they interact is in a different place in their walk with God. And so they're willing to suffer long with them. They're willing to be patient with them. Uh, Some of the people with whom we have a relationship are unbelievers, and we can generally or sometimes be more patient with them because they don't know any better, right? We think to ourselves, those believers, we understand we have the Spirit of God. We've been transformed. They don't have the Spirit of God. They, uh, they, They don't know any better. How else would we expect them to act? We begin to think, okay, I I can grow in patience with that person. But our problem often comes when we interact with other believers whom we think should know better. Well, they know better. They have the Spirit of God. What's going on with that person? And we struggle more often to be patient with the people around us in that manner, the, the person that knows what to do but chooses not to do it. One of the reasons I believe that we're impatient is because we expect people to be perfect or at least very nearly perfect. And we don't allow room for them to be still working through sanctification. Working through the details of how God is growing them in their lives. So we're not willing to wait for the growth process to take place. But patience comes when we remember that all of us, all of us as believers, are works in progress. And God is growing us at his pace and in his time. 
And guess what? He's growing your neighbor. And you're like, Lord, could you grow them a little bit faster? And he says, no. Do you know why? Because I'm growing you through them in the relationship that you have with them. And I'm growing you in patience. He's growing the person that is inconsiderate with your time. He's growing the person that doesn't like your idea. He's growing the person that doesn't communicate their distaste for your idea in a tasteful manner. He's growing them all. And he's growing them alongside of you. And so the patient person recognizes that uh, we too have room to grow. And we're willing to extend grace and leave room for growth. I love how the Apostle Paul talks about it in 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. He says, now we exhort you, brethren, warn them who are unruly. Comfort those who are faint-hearted. Uphold those who are weak. He really sets out some categories of people that we interact with, some that are responding in an unruly manner and rebellious. And he says, you should be warning those kinds of people, some that are faint-hearted or they're small-souled and easily discouraged, and we should be encouraging those. And there are some here that are weak and are barely hanging on, and he says, you need to hold on to those people. And he's putting it across the spectrum, and he ends with this. Be patient with all. Be patient with all. Because God is growing us all at his pace and in his time. And those who remember that and those who are ready to extend grace will be those who grow in patience. We all love the idea of patience. But when push comes to shove, what is our functional commitment? Is it to have the right attitude of humility, of meekness, and of patience? It sets the soil in which the unity that God requires will grow. And we must adopt this attitude if we are to be peacemakers. A second functional commitment is found at the end of verse 2. And that is a commitment to bear with one another. To bear with one another. He says, forbearing one another in love. Uh, The idea of forbearance has to do with endurance. It's similar to patience in that it suffers long with people. But the emphasis is upon bearing with difficulty and not giving up. Staying in and staying committed. To forbear with someone means that we're willing to put up with a lot of trouble and difficulty and stay and remain. When the forbearing person meets resistance, she doesn't let up. She doesn't let it keep her from being faithful to the Lord in serving those people. Remember, the ultimate goal is to walk worthy. So it's not just a matter of being stubborn and standing my ground until that other person gives. That's not the idea of forbearance, okay? It's not like, okay, if I'm just... Enduring long enough, that person will give in and see it my way. That's not forbearance. Forbearance is focused on the goal of living in relationships in a way that honors Christ, and we are committed to that. We are not giving up on that in the relationships that God has given us. We're going to accomplish that goal. We're going to forbear with one another, and we're going to put up with a lot of the issues that might come our way from other people. Remember, in the first week of the series, we said you're going to be sinned against. That's the nature of life in a fallen world. And forbearance says, I will endure even through that kind of treatment, that kind of sin against me. Listen, I look up to people in this, con- in this congregation who exhibit this quality. Uh, I would encourage you, if you're younger here, that, that you grab one of the older couples from our church and you take them out to coffee. Because I guarantee you, 40, 50, 60 years of marriage, there is some forbearance in there. There is some sense of forbearing with one another. 
And they are doing this consistently. So listen, young people, we have a treasure trove of that kind of forbearance right here in our congregation. And you need to take advantage of that. Take them out to coffee. Take them out to lunch and say, tell me how you've, uh, you've done this for these many years so I can learn. Now listen, there are those people in our church that have been here forbearing with other people in our church for decades. Many people, members of this church, for 30, 40, 50 years, 60 years. And I guarantee you that over the life of this church, of 80 years almost, that not everything has been easy. I guarantee you that with some of those people, there have been decisions made that they don't like. Decisions made that they're just saying, I would have done it differently. But guess what? They're here and faithful and forbearing with one another. They've fought the battles. They've come out on the other side for the glory of God and the good of this church. This is the kind of functional commitment that we have to have if we're to be peacemakers. Paul says we're to forbear with one another. Those whom God has put in your life. He's writing this to the Ephesian church and especially the the. Uh, a special focus that he has is that they would bear with other believers in the Ephesian church. Because God has put them together in there. You say, well, but you don't understand my situation and the difficulty of this person that is in my life. And, and perhaps it, it is very difficult. I don't want to take that away from you. But what I do know is that God has put you in that relationship. And he expects you to forbear. We recognize that there are times where abusive situations need to be addressed and people need to be protected in those situations. So understand that. By and large, however, the vast majority of our relationships, we need to forbear more. The motivation of our forbearance, you can see here, is spelled out in the last phrase of verse 2. Forbearing one another in love. This is what governs our desire to remain steadfast in our relationship. And by the way, it would be what would cause us to bring to the surface any kind of abuse that would be happening within relationships. Because it's the very motivation of love for the good of the other person that would bring something like that to light. And so don't, again, don't hear me say and put this burden uh, upon some that might be in those kinds of relationships. It would be love that would bring that kind of stuff to light. And it's love that must govern our forbearance with others. A forbearance isn't reluctantly putting up with people. Like the older sibling that just puts up with the younger sibling that wants to come along and do everything the older sibling wants to do. Right? Some of your older siblings, you get that, right? And some of you are younger siblings and are like, I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> I don't understand that. What are you talking about? Forbearance isn't standing by with an off, all attitude of superiority. Just wait until the other person comes around to see it your way. Forbearance advocated here is one that willingly sacrifices for the benefit of others. Forbearance isn't pouting and frustrating because we have to deal with foolish people. That's arrogance, not forbearance. Love says, I am willing to stay by their side. I'm willing to help them along the way, even if it's tough, because that's what's good for them. See, forbearance helps us see the difference between patience and apathy. If we're not careful, we call ourselves patient when really we're apathetic. We're indifferent to the plights of people. Forbearance doesn't give in to fear of man or laziness. A forbearing person cares about the well-being of others, so they don't just sit back and do nothing while the person ruins their relationship, either with them or with another person. Rather, they move in to be peacemakers, willing to stick it out and stay in a patient and loving manner. So we must be functionally committed to forbearance, Third and final 
functional commitment that fleshes this out on how we are to walk worthy in our relationship is the commitment to protect unity. You see it in verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity in, of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The unity the Spirit has generated. Uh, we are called to a functional commitment to the kind of uh, unity the Spirit has produced. Uh, the way this is here in this verse is not a unity that you and I drum up, but it's a unity the Spirit produces among us. It's not an artificially generated unity. It's a true unity that, as we saw last week, has been purchased with the blood of Christ and now made effective by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God produces unity with one another. It's a gift that God has given to us and one for which we are responsible to protect. In fact, Paul tells us a little bit about that unity in those next verses. In verse 4, there's one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. This is the kind of unity the Spirit produces, a oneness here within us, a oneness like that. Uh, of the Trinity. Remember how Jesus prayed, e even as you and I are one, that they may be one, even as you and I are one. That oneness that's reflected in the Trinity, that's why you see the Spirit, the Son, and the Father in these next three verses, because that oneness that is existent in the Trinity is what is intended to be played out in the relationships that we have now with one another. It's a Spirit the peace that has been brought to us, that binds us together, that keeps our relationships from unraveling with one another. And so if you are Christ's, you have the Spirit of God, and you commune with others who have the Spirit of God. And to not live at peace with one another would be as contradictory as the Trinity not being at peace together. So this is the protection. We, we have this unity, and now we are called to protect it. And in fact, we're called to eagerly protect it. Uh, Paul uses these two terms, endeavoring to keep, to help us understand not only the task, but the urgency of fulfilling the task at hand. As we saw last week, peace is that reality, and we are to protect it or to guard it and to hold, hold on to it and ensure that it continues on. We are preservers of that unity, if you will. And the task at hand is heightened by the language Paul uses to communicate the urgency here. We are to endeavor. There's a very strong word that means to spare no effort to see that it is accomplished, even to the point of painful sacrifice if necessary. That's the sense of the word he's using here. One commentator says this, it's hardly possible to render exactly the urgency contained in this word. Not only haste and passion, but a full effort of the whole person is required, involving his will, sentiment, reason, physical strength, and total attitude. It's an all-encompassed effort to do what? To protect the unity the Spirit is producing and has produced for us. It's a precious gift God has given to us and tasked us with preserving it. Uh, imagine a man of great means and great authority uh, would come to you and hand over a prized possession that he had as he went on a long journey for you to keep it and protect it and to guard it. And when he comes back, he might enjoy it once more. This treasure has been purchased for a great price, and he's keen on ensuring it remains in working order. So how do you think this man would respond if he came back and found that you were reckless and careless with the treasure that he gave you? What would you expect him to say if he knew you neglected to do what he asked you to do? You'd better be sure there would be an accounting for you. And listen, 
God has purchased this unity among believers with the price of his son's blood. And he calls us to guard it, to protect it, and to care for it, not to be reckless and indifferent about it. The relationships we have with each other are a reflection of the oneness that exists in God. So when we live at peace, we, are, we fail to live at peace, we uh, are guilty of misrepresenting God to the world. That's a serious offense, that one that we need to consider very carefully. And that's what I want you to do this morning is to evaluate with me where your functional commitments lie. Again, I'm not talking about the th things we say we're committed to, but the things that your actions reveal that you are committed to. In the first place to evaluate your commitment is your commitment to Jesus Christ. There are many in our world today that confess that they are Christians, but by their lives prove they're committed more to self. What proves that someone is a Christian is not simply the confession of their mouth, but the actions of their lives. It's the evidence, isn't it? It's the evidence of those who are truly connected to Christ that they produce fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. And Jesus poses the penetrating question in Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? What is your functional commitment there? And true faith includes turning away from our sin and submitting ourselves to Christ. We receive Christ as our Savior who saves us from the penalty of our sin. And we receive Christ as Lord who claims, who has claim over our lives. And James says that works will prove whether or not our faith is genuine or dead. We are not saved by our works. There's nothing good that we can do to earn any kind of favor with God. But our functional commitment reveals what our faith is truly in. So what does the direction of your life say about your commitment to Jesus Christ? Second, I'd ask you to evaluate your functional commitment to peacemaking to protecting the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. What's your functional commitment to that? Well, we have a sinful tendency to slide towards self-preservation rather than towards unity. It's a sinful tendency of our hearts that we have to battle. We're more inclined to protect ourselves and our reputation than to guard the unity of the Spirit. That's the sinful tendency in all of us. And what do your actions say that you're committed to. I want you to evaluate that, and I don't want you just to evaluate, but I want you to consider the functional commitments that must replace where we're at now. Lowliness and meekness and long-suffering, forbearance, and an eagerness to protect the unity of the Spirit. And Ken Sandy, the author of the book Peacemaker, helpfully identifies uh, Ways, two ways in particular that we, res we tend to respond in conflict and, and we tend to go into self-protection, uh, either escape responses or attack responses. That's what he calls them. And, and we've talked a little bit about this already. But in escape responses, we, we try to avoid unpleasant people and situations rather than working towards resolution. Uh, we pretend the problem doesn't exist or to refuse to do what is necessary to address the problem, so we run away. We change churches. We change jobs. Right? Divorce. Listen, some of the most extreme escape responses are things like suicide. It's tragic and devastating because we run. And that escape response is the opposite of the commitment to forbear with one another in love, isn't it? Isn't that what we should be putting on? Instead of running away, we stay with, forbearing with one another in love. And if this is your tendency to run away, you need to consider putting on loving endurance even when it's painful because you say, but that's going to hurt. Yes. I'm not going to sugarcoat that. You will get hurt in the process at times. 
that will happen in relationships. But listen, you will please the Lord if you forbear. And in the process, you'll find joy. That's the promise of Scripture, isn't it? And blessed is the one who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, stand in the way of sinners, or sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Yes, is it hard? Yes, is it difficult? Yes, will you be hurt? Of course. But you will please your Lord in obeying his word. And in that you'll find joy. Another sinful response in acting in self-protection is the attack response. Verbal assaults, even at times physical altercations, gossip, slander, dishonesty, exaggerations are weapons that are used in the fight against the person with whom we are in conflict. And see, when we're committed to our own reputation rather than the the unity of the spirit, we're willing to damage the other person's reputation so that our reputation is increased. And we're willing to do what's necessary. And it's a cause for divisions and fractures in relationships. And if that's your tendency, you must put on humility, patience, and meekness. Uh, Take the strength and the energy that you would use to attack the person and harness that to be used toward constructive resolution and humbly serve the person. Uh, That's what Christ does. That's what he calls us to, to use the energy and the efforts that he's granted to us to love and serve rather than to destroy people. And peace can be ruined in relationships through outright malicious divisiveness, and it can be ruined through neglect. The Lord calls us to do neither. The Lord calls us to walk worthy of our calling. And that means that we are to be people who bear with one another in love and patiently, humbly, and meekly serve one another for the glory of God. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you for the relationships that you have given us, both hard and those that are an easy source of enjoyment for us. Lord, I pray that you would make us into people whose functional commitment matches our formal commitments. We all have gaps. We realize that, Lord. We all are proud at times, out of control, not gentle, impatient. We'd rather take the easy route and be comfortable than to bear with people in love. Uh, We'd rather protect our own reputation than protect the unity of the spirit. And God, we need you. We need your spirit to do his work among us and within us. So would you do that, Father? And if there is one here who has not committed their life to Jesus Christ, Father, would you open their eyes? Would you give them sight today? In Christ's name we pray. Amen.